of Virginia with Pastor Michael Blankenship, Sister Blankenship, all of you. Uh, I've had the privilege of preaching many years ago in Norfolk, but not in this assembly. So this is my first time to preach for you today, and I'm thankful for the opportunity. Uh, as you've heard, I'm the General Superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International, of which this church is an important part. We now have right around 4,800 uh, 25 or so churches and counting our preaching points and daughter works here in the U.S. and Canada, which is our home base. Around the world, uh, there are 210 nations as defined by the Population Reference Bureau, and we are in 195 of those 210 nations. <laughs> Praise God. I've looked at the remaining list of 15 nations most of them are very small in population, say 100,000 or so island nations, or else 99% Muslim nations where it's illegal to send missionaries or even uh, to convert to Christianity. I will say of those 15 on the list, that's as of our general, as of our general conference report last fall, uh, but there's several of those that we've already appointed missionaries to or national workers to go into. So this year, we expect to reduce that list. Uh, we have 42,000 churches worldwide, uh, 40,000 credentialed ministers. Uh, so you are a part of that worldwide church. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Our mission is the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. And so I want to thank you personally uh, because... You can see what God is doing here in Virginia, but what you can't see is what God is doing around the world. Uh, but I have the privilege of seeing that. I'll share perhaps a few testimonies again in a moment, but every prayer that you pray, every dollar that you give, every soul that you win to the Lord here, disciple here, not only is it blessing the church here, but it's helping us reach the world. And that you're, that you're part of that. When you support your pastor, he's a well-recognized and appreciated minister in our fellowship, a leader here in the Virginia district, has influence around our fellowship. And so when you support him and when he travels to do district or national business and maybe he's not here exactly when you need him in every moment of every day, but you are sharing his ministry, you're supporting his ministry, uh, you're participating in world revival. Uh, you know, one church can meet most of its own needs just in isolation, but that's not the plan of God. It's God's plan for us to be connected, for individuals to be connected to a local body with a pastor, and for local churches to be connected in an international body where we can do advance the kingdom of God. It's not about us. It's not the primary reason for being part of your local church or the international church is not what's in it for me, but it's how can I do the will of God and how can I advance the kingdom of God around the world. So I would like for you to worship as my wife sings, testifies. Maybe she's going to preach. We'll see. I don't think so. So thankful to be with you, and it's so wonderful to walk in the doors and feel his presence. We're all one family. We have one father, and we're going to one home. I'm so thankful that he knows my name. Wherever you are, he knows where you are. Whatever you're going through, he knows what you're going through. He knows your name, and he knows where you are. I have a
for him this morning. Let's worship him. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you know me, God. Thank you know I know where I am. Hallelujah. Would you like to stand one more time? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. While you're standing, I'm going to read from Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and verse 12. And I want to talk to you, preach to you about the grace of God. Titus 2, 11 says this, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Amen. You may be seated. I'm talking to you about grace. You know, the grace of God, uh, this verse says, has appeared to every single human being to lead us to salvation. I truly believe that. You might ask, well, what about people who've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? How does grace come to them? Well, if you read the book of Romans, chapter 1 says, everyone has a witness in, in creation. Chapter 2 says, everyone has a witness in conscience. Even people who've never heard the gospel... If they look at the stars in the sky, if they look at the intricate workings of the human body, of the plant and animal kingdoms, of nature itself, they would know there is a creator. All right. And if they would seek him and worship him to the limit of their knowledge, God would continue to reveal more truth to them, to lead them to a point where they could be saved. Every human being has some conscience. It may not be fully developed uh, in the absence of the teaching of the Word of God, but every human has a sense of right and wrong. Amen. If I tell you that a lion killed a gazelle, uh, we don't decide to execute the lion or put him in prison for the rest of his life. That's just normal. If we hear that one animal eats another, uh, we don't think anything about it, but if we hear that one human has killed another without cause, then we know something's wrong. Amen. When we hear that one human eats another, something in us says that's wrong. Amen. Why? Because uniquely we are created in the image of God with a moral nature and a moral right. conscience. We yeah. know there is such a thing as right and wrong. Yeah. And so everyone has a witness. That's the grace of God. That's God reaching out to every human being. And I'm happy to tell you God's grace is working in miraculous ways across our world. Let me share a few testimonies. Uh, at, my wife and I travel all over the U.S. and we take a few trips every year to other parts of the world where we have many nations with strong churches. Recently in the summer, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the church in Slovakia. And uh, the, uh, 100 years ago, there were some Slovakian immigrants to the U.S. who received the Holy Ghost. They went back to their home country, shared the gospel, started a church. Uh, that was in the nation at that time, Czechoslovakia. Uh, and it wasn't long until the Nazis took over. And then after that, the communists took over. And our little church was uh, taken over by the communists, turned into a store. And the believers had to worship in secret, in hiding. Our pastor at that time was a blacksmith. So he had a blacksmith shop. And people would gather there secretly uh, at night to have service. And in his backyard, he had a well, a fountain, and he made a pool. And they used that for baptism in the middle of the night. After communism fell, 
eventually uh, the government gave that property back to us. I was able to preach there in that first year or two in the early 1990s. And the church is still going on today, a hundred years later. Praise God. Nazism has come and gone. Communism has come and gone. But the church of Jesus Christ is still moving forward. Praise God. Last year I preached in the country of Liberia in the last 25 years. Liberia has undergone two civil wars and the deadly Ebola crisis. And uh, in the civil war, I talked to our national superintendent, Brother Benda, and uh, he was arrested by the rebels in the civil war, scheduled for execution. They marched him down the streets of the town, stripped off all of his clothes, and as the custom was, they had a firing squad behind him as he marched. At any moment, he was waiting for the bullets to kill him. But as he marched to his death, the commander suddenly called out and said, Halt! They stopped. The commander said, Why are we killing this man? Nobody knew why. He said, Take him aside. We're going to kill the next man. And so our minister's life was spared. It seemed random, but we know it was the grace of God. Of course, we don't always receive every victory in this life. Our general secretary at that time uh, was traveling in the city, uh, and the rebels stopped him, and a, a child soldier stopped him, and he didn't respond the way the boy liked it, and so he shot him dead on the spot. I met the son of that secretary who was in our church today. In the middle of that crisis, the headquarters church in Monrovia was caught in the middle of between the rebel army and the government army. And it, it's a compound enclosed by a wall. And so about 2,000 people rushed inside the compound, inside the church for safety. For three weeks, they were caught in the middle of the war. They couldn't leave the compound or they were subject to being killed instantly. Uh, as the days wore on, they ran out of food and they slowly began to starve. At first, the pastor would preach uh, from the pulpit, but he got too weak to stand, so he would just sit and preach. Finally, he got so weak, he would just lie on the floor and preach from the floor. The people got too weak to stand and raise their hands, so eventually they would just sit on the floor and prop their hands on the benches in order to be able to raise them. Someone asked the pastor, why would you serve God at a time like this? He answered, to whom would we turn? Where else could we go? He's our only hope. They survived three weeks in that condition, but they all made it without one of them dying. They were delivered. Praise God. And I can tell you about the Ebola crisis. We have a medical clinic that ministers to the poor in Liberia. And during that time, we ministered to hundreds of people. Three of our own workers died of Ebola in reaching out to others. So we don't receive all victories in this life. Some victories wait the resurrection. But I'm happy to tell you that despite the Civil War, despite uh, the Ebola crisis, today our church in Liberia reports over 100,000 constituents. The church is moving forward and moving on by the grace of God. In uh, Recently, just in October, my wife and I went uh, to, the, uh, to, to Ghana for uh, what we call the Africa Leadership Conference. It's held every five years with leaders from all over Africa. There are about 50 countries in sub-Saharan Africa which is how we define the Africa region. And uh, we have works in 41 of those nations. So at the seminar, we had about 300 workers, uh, uh, workers and their spouses from 38 of the 41 nations. So it was a wonderful time of training and fellowship and inspiration for the continent of Africa. At that conference, we learned some interesting things. One is that our church in Madagascar has about 200,000 believers. And at the conference, they appointed a missionary from Madagascar to reach two island nations that are on our list of unreached nations. The, praise God. 
They're the countries of Mayotte and Comoros. So uh, not only are we sending missionaries from North America, but we have very strong uh, nations that are sending, or very strong churches that are sending uh, missionaries from one nation to the other. In uh, Brazil, we have 200,000 believers there as well. They speak Portuguese. Uh, there are five Portuguese-speaking nations in Africa. And so our Brazilian church has sent missionaries to four of those five nations, and we're working on finding someone for the fifth nation. So that would be yet another nation open to the gospel in the near future. Praise God. One uh, of the nations I'm not going to mention, but it was closed, heavily Muslim, but we just baptized our first pastor in the name of Jesus Christ. And so now we're open, we've are open. we opened another country. Another nation that I'm not going to mention, also heavily Muslim. We have resident missionaries there, but they were targeted by ISIS, had to flee the country. But they insisted on going back to another location. And so recently we've sent them back to another location in that country. There are modern day uh, missionaries who are sacrificing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You say, well, why would you do that? It's the grace of God. They're trusting in the grace of God. Not only on a, uh, a big level, but on an individual level. Uh, my wife were, were, and I were in the country of Turkey. It is Muslim, but it does allow freedom of religion, and so we're able to operate legally there. And we have hundreds of immigrants who fled from Iran uh, where they don't have freedom of religion. And uh, many of them we baptize in Jesus' name. We've received the Holy Ghost. Some of them have gone back into their country and having secret house meetings. So we do have churches in that country, but we're not able to give you any information about them. Some people, their form of church is to sit in the privacy of their home behind closed doors and watch video services in their language produced by the United Pentecostal Church. In the privacy of their home, they can receive the Holy Ghost. If they want to get baptized, they can cross the border, contact us, uh, on their vacation, get baptized, and then we send them back home to serve the Lord. I'll tell you one testimony, a young man that we met in Turkey. He was from Iran. He was a professor in Iran. But as he studied Islam, uh, he began to see discrepancies and problems and things that weren't correct. And so he eventually decided there must not be a God. He became an atheist. Unfortunately for him, he made some statements that let people know of his change of beliefs, and so he was arrested by the police, put in jail, and then he was released to be under house arrest for two years. But during that time, um, somewhere along the way, his mother had immigrated to Turkey, had become a Christian, come into one of our churches, and she was praying for him. So he decided to flee also, so he fled the house arrest, um, he paid a smuggler a large sum of money to take him across the border. He got into the border region. The smuggler just abandoned him, and he was stuck there in the woods for about uh, over a month trying to find a way to evade the guards and get across the border. He finally made it across only to be arrested on the Turkish side as an illegal immigrant. But eventually, he was able to apply as a refugee. They released him. And he met with his mother, and she said, you have to come to our church. So being an atheist, he didn't believe that the Christians would have any better answers than the Muslims. And so he told me uh, later, as he shared his testimony with me, he said, I had 50 questions that I had written down that I was going to ask the, the Christian preacher about believing in God. But he said, when I walked into the service... He said, for the first time in my life, I felt the presence of God. He said, tears began flowing down my cheeks. And right there, that answered all 50 questions. Now he's baptized in Jesus' name. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. He's a witness 
in Istanbul, Turkey. We have another pastor that was that recently married a Kurdish woman uh, in that country, and she we we had prayer for her because her family found out that she had married uh, a Christian preacher, and uh, one of the brothers text her and said, we're going to kill you. Uh, and so they had to close off all communication with their family, and they're praying that God would protect them and somehow uh, help them to, to work this out with their family. Our fellow believers are suffering and sacrificing for the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's by the grace of God. Moving closer to home, my wife and I many years ago started a church in Austin, Texas. Uh, we started in our home, and uh, we served as pastor for 18 years until I was elected as general superintendent, and then, of course, resigned the church. And my longtime associate, Rodney Shaw, was elected as pastor. So we, we started in our home. We were in a rented building for four years. We built our first building, then our second building, then a major remodeling, and then finally the fourth building program. It's a beautiful building that um, right now, if you go to Austin, it's on the freeway where 100,000 cars pass twice each day. It's uh, about a couple of miles away from a new uh, projected um, plant of um, Apple computer that's a billion dollar plant they just announced. And uh, so it's 12 acres of land on the freeway, 100,000 square feet, a thousand seat auditorium, and it's capable of internal expansion up to about 2,500. And uh, they're continuing to finish out parts of the building as they grow. In fact, they're in the middle of an, another phase of completing more classrooms and um, gym, fellowship hall, and a, and a small chapel to seat 250 people for smaller events. And so there are about a thousand believers associated with that church. But during that time, while I was pastor, we started 16 other churches, Daughter Works, uh, Preaching Points, and uh, over time, some closed down, more started. I think there are probably around 20 churches out of that original church today. So that's another 1,000 believers. And so God has blessed the church. We can see maybe about 2,000 believers as a result of those initial efforts many years ago. It's amazing how God works and so many ways. And of course, we have many different testimonies over the years, but I'll tell you one that happened just in September that Brother Shaw told me about. I was preaching there on Sunday morning, and this happened that day. But there was a man who had been a Buddhist for 23 years. And of course, uh, Buddhism emphasizes meditation. In his meditation, something started happening where he felt attacked by demonic forces. Uh, that shocked him and surprised him, and evidently he was hungry for truth, seeking for a solution, seeking after God while not knowing him. So by God's grace, one night God gave him a dream. In the dream, a woman in white said, your Savior is Jesus. Jesus is the answer to what you're seeking. So he, began, he, he found a large non-denominational church um, to go to because he didn't know where to go. And as he continued going there, he felt there's got to be something more. So he began to ask questions, and he began to try to find out what is there. And I, I'm looking for the power of God. Someone told him, sounds like what you want is the Pentecostals. <laughs> so, yes, we have a reputation. I happen to know that particular church. Many years ago, we had someone to visit that church and, and to visit from that church to our church to receive the Holy Ghost. And I talked to them. They said, yes. Um, you know, the people there told me, yeah, we believe in, in the Holy Spirit, but if you want to receive the Holy Ghost, you need to go down to that Pentecostal church and receive the Holy Ghost. Then you can come back to our church. So anyway, they said, I think you, you're, you're interested in the Pentecostals. So he went online, and he did a search, Pentecostal Church Austin, and it came up, New Life Austin. So he came to church for the first time, and once again, he told Pastor Shaw, when I walked in the doors of the church, I knew this 
is what I've been looking for. He said, I felt the power of God. That night, he was baptized. Buddhist for 23 years, he was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came up out of the water, Pastor Shaw laid hands on him, as the Bible said. God filled him with the Holy Ghost, and he spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. That's the grace of God. Now, what is grace? The classic definition that people give is unmerited favor. That's certainly true. What that means is God blesses you. God saves you. God helps you. And it's not because we deserve it. You couldn't earn God's grace. You couldn't purchase God's grace. You can't live a good enough life to deserve God's grace. The way people are saved is not by living a holy life for six months and then God says, okay, you lived a holy life for six months. Now I'm going to forgive you of your sins, and I'm going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. No, we come to God as sinners. The moment we repent of our sins, God accepts that. Not because we're good, but because he loves us. Because Jesus Christ died and paid the price for our sins. Grace was purchased by the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you repent of your sins and you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are washed away. Not because you're a good person, but because of the grace of God. Because you responded to God's grace. And God will fill you with His Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Not because we're better than anybody else. Not because we paid our tithes. Not because we dress modestly. Not because we don't smoke. Not because we don't drink. But it's because of the grace of God. He loved us. We were unworthy. But he has made us worthy. We don't live a holy life to get saved. We live a holy life because we are saved. We live a holy life because the grace of God is working inside us. In other words, grace is God's gift to us. It's free. It's a gift. But that's only half the definition. As I've just indicated, grace, when it, grace finds us, it doesn't leave us where we are, but it begins to change us. Amen. The text that I read says the grace of God that brings salvation, it starts teaching us. Yes. It specifically teaches us to live a holy life. And so that's why you're in a holiness church today. We don't think that we're better than anyone else. We're not holier than thou. We don't think our good works can earn us a place in heaven. But we understand that God's grace is supposed to change us. It's supposed to work in us. If there's no fruit of change, if there's no pursuit of holiness, that indicates we're not letting grace work. Because grace is not only God's gift to us, but grace is also God's work in us. And that is liberating because that means no matter who you are, no matter what sin you've committed, no matter what addiction or what lifestyle you've been part of, you can be changed by the grace of God. If you're not a living according to God's plan, you can receive power to break from the past and live a new life. You can be changed by the power of God. Grace is not only God's gift to us, but grace is God's work in us. That means there's hope for everybody. That means this message works for every human being. Every one of us can live a holy life. Every one of us can be saved. Every one of us can go to heaven. Why? Because of the grace of God. Grace. Let me share something from the Word of God relative to grace. In the book of Malachi, chapter 4, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And when we read Malachi, we get the last prophet who spoke to the people of Israel. And then there were 400 years of silence until John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. When you read the Old Testament, you're looking at God's old covenant, the first covenant that God made with Israel. It was, as the Bible explains, the book of Galatians, the law was like a tutor or a schoolmaster. 
teaching children to bring them to maturity so they would be ready for the fullness of revelation, which came through Jesus Christ. So the law was full of do this and don't do that. The law was trying to teach us that we're sinners, we need a Savior. But the law itself couldn't give us the Savior. It was preparing the way for the Savior. And so when you read the book of Malachi, you're reading God's last word to his people under the old covenant. Last words are pretty significant. So I'd like to read in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 through verse 6, you'll see God's last word under the old covenant. Malachi 4, 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now I want you to notice something here. Uh, he says, before judgment comes, I will send the man of God. Before judgment comes, I will send the word of God. Before judgment comes, I will send revival. Notice he described it of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to their fathers. Now, the fathers were the heads of households. So I see this as family reconciliation. And, of course, families are building blocks of society. We see in our own day. If you list the main problems of our society, poverty, homelessness, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, juvenile delinquency, crime, racism, all these things, almost all of it goes back to fathers not being in the home. And families broken apart and dysfunctional. Yeah. Almost all poverty is associated with broken homes. All right. And so if, when we say restoring families, to me, that's revival. Yeah. If you want to broaden it in that message, what he's saying is, I'm going to put families back together. Yeah. I'm going to put society back together. I am going to address the root cause of the problems that all of humans are dealing with. In other words, it is a message of revival, restoration, and renewal. What a message of grace. But notice carefully what happens if you don't accept God's grace. There is a judgment. Now, we don't like to talk about that. But if I'm going to preach about grace, I have to preach about what happens when you reject God's grace. The alternative is you face God's judgment. So there's a promise, but there's also a warning. There's a blessing, but if we reject the blessing, what does it say? There is a curse. Now, that doesn't mean God sends anyone to the lake of fire. God doesn't do that. People make choices that determine their own destiny. Yeah. Yeah. Think of it this way. God is the source of grace. The book of James says every good gift, every perfect gift comes from the Father above. God is the very source of life. He's the creator. So when we break fellowship with God, and of course sin is what breaks fellowship with God, then we're disconnected from the source of life. God is holy. He cannot have fellowship with sin. When we live in sin, we break the connection with the holy God. And therefore, we disconnect from the very source of life, from grace, from love, from joy, from peace, from every good thing. Even sinners today are living in the grace of God. The atheist doesn't realize it, but every time he experiences love, joy, or peace to any degree, any degree it's because of God. Yeah. That's what's going to make eternity without God so awful. For the first time, people will wake up and be in a world that's totally absent. Grace, love, joy, peace, life. It's like flowers. If you have beautiful flowers in the garden, you cut them, put them in the vase, they're just as beautiful in the vase as they were a few minutes ago in the garden. Uh -huh. But there's a difference. They're cut off from the source of life. Amen. 
So in a matter of days, they're going to wither, die, and they're gone because they're disconnected from life. So it is with human beings. We look at someone 70 years old, 80 years old, or however long God allows the person to live. And they might be rich, famous, enjoyed life, had all the benefits. And we say, wow, what a wonderful life. But if they don't know God, it's just an illusion. Because when their time is gone, there's no more life. They're forever separated from the presence of God. So don't look at temporary things. Look at eternity. We must be connected with the source of life. We must be connected to God. There's grace. But if we reject God's grace, there's judgment. There's a promise, but a warning. There's a blessing, but a curse. Now I'd like to turn to the New Testament. The very last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And let's look at God's last word under the New Covenant. That's the covenant to us today. We are living under the new covenant. We're in the age of the church, the last age before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is God's last word to us today? We find it in the book of Revelation, the very last book of the New Testament, and therefore the very last book of the Bible, the very last book to be written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for God's people. Let's read Revelation 22, starting in verse 17. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What an amazing statement of the grace of God. Can you imagine anything more powerful, anything more wonderful, anything more inclusive than this? It is the message of grace. The Spirit says, come. The Holy Spirit is here today. What you're feeling is not just because of music. It's not just because of clapping of hands. But the Spirit of God, the presence of Almighty God is moving, drawing us to fellowship with Him. And not only the Spirit, but the bride. The bride is the church. That's us. We also say, come. That means the church has to be inclusive just like the Spirit of God is inclusive. Now, if you come here, you're going to hear a message from Scripture. You're going to hear a message of right and wrong. You're not going to hear a message of compromise. But at the same time, you will know this church is for every human being. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're black or white or somewhere in between, whether you speak Spanish or English or some other language. You're welcome in this place because of the grace of God. The Spirit says come. But not only that, the church, the bride says come. There's no room for racism or prejudice in the house of God. Praise God. Young, old, rich, poor, educated, uneducated. It doesn't matter your past life of sin. It doesn't matter your lifestyle or addiction. Now, you're going to hear the truth of God's word and God's plan for your life. But regardless of that, we want you to be here in the presence of God. You say, well, what if somebody comes in the church and they're living a sinful life? They're living in adultery or fornication or homosexual behavior, alcoholism or drug abuse and on and on and on. How should we treat those people? Well, I tell you how. You say, hello, my name is John. Glad to have you in church. You say, you mean the church wants people with these lifestyles? Of course we do. If somebody's sick, you send them to the hospital. If somebody's a sinner, you send them to church. All of us have sinned and fall short 
of the glory of God. Of course we want people from every background, every lifestyle, every sin to come into the house of God. We welcome them because we know the same God that changed our lives can change their life. The same God that forgave us of our sins can forgive them of their sins. That's grace. Grace. The spirit and the bride say come. What are the qualifications for receiving God's grace? Let him that heareth say come. You got to listen. You got to open your ears and receive. And let him that is a thirst come. You got to be thirsty. If you don't want God, God's not going to force himself on you. You've got to recognize I need God. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I need you. you got to be thirsty. Oh, I feel the presence of God right now. The Spirit is drawing souls. And whosoever will, anybody who wants it, the grace of God is for you. The water of life. The cleansing, the refreshing, the filling, the sustaining, the source of life is for you free. What a message of grace. But I got to keep reading. Verse 18, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophets of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Wow. There's a warning. Now, I'm preaching from an iPad when I travel. It's easy because I'm going to have all, like, ten versions of the Bible, all my notes, hundreds of sermons and studies, 50 books, all of my books, and more besides Right here. But let's say I had a leather-bound Bible, and I wrote a few pages and said, um, Bernard's letter to the Virginians. And I said, uh, Pastor Blankenship, I'm giving this to you, and I want you to preach from this at least once a month. That'd be a little scary, wouldn't it? I want you to stick in your Bible right after 2 Corinthians. That would be wrong. That would be adding to God's word. That would put me under the judgment of this passage. But if I just teach and preach doctrines that aren't in the word of God, if I add traditions of men and impose them as mandatory doctrines upon the church, aren't I doing the same thing? That's why this is an apostolic church. What that means is we follow the preaching and teaching of the apostles as recorded in the New Testament. That's why this is a Pentecostal church. That means we believe the same experience on the day of Pentecost is for the church today. That's why we baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. We do not want to add traditions from the creeds and the councils and the popes of later centuries. We want to go back to the original. We don't want to add to God's word. Or what if I took my leather-bound Bible and tore out a few pages, threw them in the trash? That would be scary too, wouldn't it? But what if I don't do that, but there are just certain doctrines I ignore, certain teachings I say, that doesn't matter today. Oh, that was just the first century. The Apostle Paul was a limited man of his time. He was under the mistaken theory uh, that we, we don't follow those teachings today. It doesn't matter about modesty of dress. It doesn't matter about sexual morality. We can adjust to the 21st century. Whatever modern psychology and sociology teaches us, we're free to do whatever our culture endorses and all of that. We'd be taken away from God's word. The truth of God's word is not subject to evolutionary change under social pressure. 
It's the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We're supposed to contend earnestly for the original faith. Don't change it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Just preach it. That's why we're still a holiness church. Regardless of what the culture says, we still have to follow the teachings of the Bible. The Bible teaches men and women should dress different, should look different, should act different. We still follow what the Bible says regardless of what culture says. We can't change the message. So notice you find a warning. It's parallel to Malachi, which shouldn't surprise us because after all, it's the same God, same character. But notice there's grace. But if we reject grace, there's judgment. There's a promise, but also a warning. There's a blessing, but if we reject the blessing, there's a curse. It's parallel, but I, I still have a couple more verses to read. I haven't quite got to the end yet, so let me finish this out. In Revelation chapter 20, or the 22, but verse 20, 21, the very end of the Bible, He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's the end of the Bible. Now, I've told you there's a parallel between the end of the Old Testament and the end of the New Testament. There is a message of grace in both places, but also a message of judgment in both places. That's true. But have you noticed there's one difference? The book of Malachi, the Old Testament, ends with the very last word is curse. That's the last point. But the New Testament ends with a prayer for grace. There's a difference. Because God's last word to us is not judgment. God's very last word to us is grace. I'm almost finished with my message. I spent the whole time trying to get here. Here's my title. I'm not going on another hour. Here's my title. Grace has the last word. I've come to Norfolk, Virginia to tell you, Norfolk Apostolic Church, friends and visitors, in God's plan for your life, grace has the last word. God does not want you to be lost. God does not want you to be destroyed. God does not want you to be cursed. But in God's plan, grace has the last word. Don't give up now. You got to keep on keeping on. If you're bound by sin, there is deliverance. There is forgiveness. There is healing. There is hope. Because in God's plan, grace has the last word. If you're burdened over a lost loved one, if you got a kid that's on drugs or backslidden, don't give up. Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Keep on worshiping. When you don't know what else to do, keep on doing what you know to do. In time of trouble, don't run away from the church. Run to the church. Don't run away from the pastor. Run to the pastor. Don't run away from God. Run to God. Just keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep on worshiping. Because in God's plan, grace has the last word. Oh, let's stand together right now. The Holy Spirit is moving in this place. The devil says, you're defeated. But God says, I got a plan that's bigger than the devil. The devil says, you're bound. But God says, I have a plan to set you free. If you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with discouragement, if you're struggling with thoughts of suicide, don't give in to that. But just remember, grace has the last word. There's hope beyond your discouragement. There's hope beyond your depression. 
There's a life worth living. There's eternal life. Hold on to the promise of God. If you're not living for the Lord right now, obviously you need to repent of your sins. Here's the way to do it. You come to God and you say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I surrender to you. I make no excuses. No, I just simply say, I'm sorry. Please change me. Please forgive me. Please give me power. And once you prayed that prayer, I surrender completely to you. You will actually feel the weight of sin begin to lift. Some people make the mistake of just stopping right there and say everything's good. That's what a lot of churches do. But what you're supposed to do after you repent, you start worshiping. After you repent, you don't start begging or you don't walk away and quit. But you start worshiping. Thank you, Jesus, for what I feel right now. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in my life. Thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And you know what happens? As you're praising God, the Spirit will fall upon you. Take control of your tongue. That's why you've got to speak. You can't close your mouth. You've got to speak it out. And while you're praising God in your own language, the Holy Spirit will take control. You'll begin to speak miraculously in a language you never learned as the Holy Spirit speaks from the inside out. That's the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God to dwell in your life. It's more than just a feel-good experience. It actually gives you the power to change your whole life. It is a, it's a new beginning. It's a new life. That's what God wants to do today. And if you have already received that experience, I want you to know it's a new life. It's something you can live every day. If you stumble and fall, don't let the devil beat you up in condemnation. Get back up that very moment and say, God, forgive me. I don't want to live like that. I don't want to be a sinner. I want to be a Christian. If you sin by word or deed or even in your thoughts, don't just allow the devil to beat you up with condemnation but get back up and say I, I believe in the Lord I want to live a holy life I want to be filled with their spirit I refuse to succumb to the devil remember grace has the last word I don't care what you did this week grace is still speaking in your life grace offers hope grace offers a new beginning if you need healing physically or spiritually, grace is speaking today. If your family needs a miracle, grace is speaking today. Maybe you're like Saul of Tarsus. You are a blasphemer, a murderer. But you know what? God arrested him and offered him grace. He became the great apostle Paul. Or maybe you're like John Mark, the young man who accompanied Paul on his missionary journey and then failed and went back. Paul refused to use him on the second journey. But Barnabas said, you know what? I think I can use him. And later on, the Apostle Paul commended John Mark. John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. Even if you messed up in ministry, even if you messed up after serving the Lord, there's a future for you. Even if the Apostle Paul is not so sure, there's an Barnabas that is sure. What I'm saying, God has plan B, plan C, plan D. Don't let the devil block you and say, I blew God's plan. There's no hope for me. You may have blown God's plan, and there may be some consequences, but God still has a plan that's bigger than your sin, that's bigger than your mistake, that's bigger than your fault, that's bigger than your failure. What I'm preaching is grace has the last word. Grace has the last word. I've come to Virginia to tell somebody, grace is speaking today. Close your eyes with me. If there's somebody you need the Lord, I want you to come quickly to the front. You need to repent of your sins, or maybe you've already done that. You need to receive the Holy Ghost. If you'd like to ask someone to come pray with you, do it right now. I want to make this appeal first. If there's someone that needs forgiveness of sin, someone that needs to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you've never spoken in tongues, I want you to come right now. If there's someone that needs personal renewal, would you come? I know there got to be some people. Respond. 
grace is speaking today. Now I'm going to expand this. If you need to receive the Holy Ghost, come on right here, right now. But I'm going to expand it. Is there somebody you need healing for your body? Is there somebody you need an answer to prayer for your family? I want you to come all across the building. Would you come to the front? Let's start, saints of God, let's pray for one another. Let's be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. This is an opportunity for grace to overcome every sin, every obstacle. All across the building, if you can't make your way to the front, why don't you at least find a place to pray where you are? Let's call upon the Lord because remember, in God's plan for your life, Grace has the last word. needs a miracle in his eye. In the name of Jesus. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Speak the word. Speak the word of faith. God, let your grace flow in this heart. Let there be a grace of healing. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Come on, let the Holy Ghost flow. Ah, let the grace of healing, the grace of miracles take place. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life. Yes, that's born. it. That's it. That's the Holy Jesus Spirit. Is Spirit of the Lord is ministering.
That's it. Just let the Holy Ghost flow a few minutes. Spring up a well. Focus us. Mercy is so- 
Let's worship God. Man. I confirm that word in Jesus' name. just to say to the church before we leave this morning and the, the, the word just kept coming back to my mind refocus, refocus refocus I confirm that the tongues interpretation that is where we're at there's we all have varying levels of drama that is going on in our lives at any given time. It's just part of life. Every once in a while it gets exaggerated. It gets big for a little bit in season. Our dilemma is that we have spent too much time pondering the problem instead of, and it's caused us to lose our focus on God this and his brother Bernard were sharing some of the stories, some of them I actually knew about some I didn't as he was sharing them I thought of our brothers and sisters around the world that have to endeavor to walk with God under such brutal political circumstances and so forth, sometimes in fear of their daily life and I can't help but have to acknowledge that sometimes what I call a problem may not really hit them. Somebody came in my office the other day and showed me a pack of a protein. It was just a dry mix, you know, and you mix it in water. So this stuff's really good for you. I said, yeah. I said, you know, I notice what my body calls food and what I call food are like two totally different things. And I think sometimes in the kingdom, if we're not careful, We'll allow the enemy's drama around us to be exaggerated, to be things that are so much bigger than it really is. And if people can live and serve God under fear of death every day, I think you and I ought to be able to do it pretty adequately without all of that on us every day. Amen. I don't care what you're facing, don't care what's going on, lift up your eyes on high. Let's come with your strength. It doesn't come from the problem. It comes from the Lord. And that's how we praise him through. You know, sometimes he delivers us out of the valley, and sometimes he walks us through the valley. We live in the natural, but we have access to the supernatural. But I never know when the supernatural can, can access it. In the meantime, I've got to keep my walk with God in order, keep my faith in order, keep my joy in order, keep my praise in order. Amen? Let's do that right now. Let's lift our voice unto the Lord and praise Him one more time today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this word. Thank you for this service. Thank you for what you're doing in this house today. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Would you give God a shout of praise? In Jesus' name. Glory. We've been praying for a lot of people and different ones of you have been ministering to people. If you've prayed with anyone that God's filled with the Holy Ghost or so forth, please make Brother Kretzer aware of it. He'll be up here in the altar somewhere. Uh, Brother Kretzer, yeah, here he is. <laughs> Uh, he'll be up there to make sure he knows so we can follow up. God bless you. Tonight at 6 o'clock, Brother Bernard is going to be ministering again in the evening service. Greet one another, love one another in the name of the Lord. God bless you.